welcome to episode 187 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, I need to say thanks to some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Daniel Sage, Jay Alexander, Jane Turnbull Lyon, Zori Mobley, Mama Rama, Eliza DePeel, Lisa Morgan, Julia Havens, Vicky, Lynn, Sabita Zafar, Paul, Amy Steffler, Lynette Bissell, Estelle Miller, Katie Roberts, Paper B411, Claire Boyle, and Zarina Rigby. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week, our film review is The Happening. The Happening was released in 2008. It has 5 out of 10 on IMDb and 17% on Rotten Tomatoes. An apocalyptic threat to humanity arrives out of the clear blue sky with a series of violent, inexplicable deaths spreading around the country. The cause of the terrifying phenomenon remains unknown, prompting science teacher Elliot Moore, played by Mark Wahlberg, and his wife Alma, played by Zoe Deschanel, and his colleague Julian to try and elude the invisible killer in Pennsylvania's farmland. Soon it becomes clear that no one is safe. And you know what? It's true. No one is safe from this absolute fucking car crash of a film. Just, I don't even know where to start with this. I honestly thought, right, I thought people don't like it. Do you know the way sometimes it's cool not to like things? So people don't like certain films and then you watch them and you're like, oh, it's not that bad. Or it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit cheesy, but it's still watchable. This film was absolutely horrendous. Like, I personally want to write to M. Night Shyamalan and say give me give me my time back you owe me two hours of my time because it was it was honest it was honestly so bad I can't who's given this five out of ten on IMDb because you're lying all right you're lying what why are you trying to impress M. Night Shyamalan he's never he's never going to love you for giving this film five out of ten on IMDb even 17 percent on Rotten Tomatoes is still too much I honestly have not seen a film this bad in a really long time take a deep breath Emma take a deep breath okay let's I didn't even do a likes and dislikes column to be honest usually I do I have an actual column written down in front of me that I refer to I don't even have one I don't even have one this time. The script was horrendous. My notable favourite moment in the film was when, as they are watching these attacks happen on on somebody's like screen, this woman goes, what kind of terrorists are these? Literally like that. I mean, I could have been in the film. I could have, I could have acted as that woman in the film. It was, it was incredible. It was incredibly bad. So the film opens, sorry, we're going to go back again. I'm just ranting now. The film opens with Marky Mark as a science teacher giving a speech about bees disappearing with his very engaged class of teenagers. And they are talking about this, um, this phenomenon about bees disappearing. And then they realise there has been an event which has happened in and around Central Park in which people have sort of frozen and then they have gone on to take their own lives. Right. In increasingly violent ways. And they think it's some sort of terrorist, like chemical attack. And almost, I mean, literally immediately, almost immediately the cities are evacuated. I mean, within within minutes, the cities are evacuated. And cities are evacuated and they realise that it's this, whatever this thing is, it is spreading. And honestly, I could have done with the apocalypse to come and take me out mid-film so I wouldn't have to watch any more of it. It is impossible to truly fathom how bad the script writing And the acting is in this film. Like Mark Wahlberg isn't necessarily a bad actor. Like he's fine. Uh, Zoe Deschanel. I've never really seen her in anything. But as far as I'm aware. She's a relatively good actor. And John Alberto Leguizamo. uh, I love him. He is in uh, Romeo and Juliet. Love him. He is also in it. And I just don't think any of them were given any script to work with. And the direction must have been truly awful. And in the entire time that this end of the world is happening, all around them, they've witnessed multiple people die really horrifically. They're all running for their lives, etc, etc. Not one tear, from what I can remember, is shed between any of the main characters, which is pretty incredible. I actually think the story has the potential to be really good. And the story had the potential to be a really good commentary on global warming and what we're doing to the environment, etc., etc. Like I, the climate crisis, brilliant. Talk about it, M. Night. Like 
write write films about it it's really important but not this film not this film because this film is so bad it makes me want global warming to speed up because if we're making films like this like what are we doing and I know that since this film has come out and was pretty much universally well it actually wasn't universally slated like I did read some genuinely like quite positive reviews about it but I can only assume that those reviews were actually written by the plants who are the enemies in the movie and they were akin to plants good people bad but besides that a lot of people have written about this film since and been like yeah it's satire you just didn't get it I'm sorry it's not satire I do not for a second believe that anybody involved in this film thought it was satire at the time I think they only said it was satire maybe afterwards because it's honestly so bad I even to be honest it's so bad that I looked up how much this film costs to make it costs 60 million dollars to make what you spend the money on what you spend the money on because it wasn't acting classes it wasn't script writing what was the money spent on do you know what it was spent on it was definitely spent on brainstorming all the different ways that we can film people taking their own lives and having watched this film and knock at the cabin last week i wonder if because m night Shyamalan had such success with films like six sense and signs which i thought were brilliant films i even i liked the village i thought the village was a good movie You know, because he had such success with those films, do people just not tell him no? Do people just not say, this isn't actually a really good idea and this actually isn't working and we need to kind of go back to the drawing board a little bit? And I think part of the reason why I'm so cross about this is because I do like an apocalyptic film, genuinely. Like, I wanted Knock at the Cabin to be really good. I wanted this to be really good. I love a film about the apocalypse. I love an apocalypse story. I love a survival story. Like, they're great. But yet here I was watching Mark Wahlberg looking surprised for two hours and um, just a point to note anybody who has seen this film like the hot dog monologue was so bizarre it made me laugh but not in the way I think that they had intended it to be funny or be quirky and entertaining in that moment I mean the cough syrup monologue I enjoyed it I, thought, I actually thought that was very funny the hot dog monologue I what was going on there what was going on there And I thought to myself while I was watching this film, I love my job. I love that this is my job. I feel very blessed that this is my job. I feel like a very lucky person. But this film made me want to go back to teaching. That's obviously a joke. I am uh, being dramatic for effect. But I'm going to give this film a big fat zero. Big fat zero stars. It's been a while. I think Open House was the last one I give zero stars to. But a big fat zero. Didn't think there was any redeeming qualities. I'm sick of this. I'm never watching an M. Night Shyamalan movie again. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. I cannot keep risking life and limb in this zombie apocalypse to go to the grocery store. If only there was an easier way. Wait, what's this conveniently placed leaflet? With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and the impending zombie doom and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. You know what'll really take your mind off the flesh-hungry horde? Fast and fresh recipes. HelloFresh's latest line of meals featuring robust flavours and filling portions are ready in less than 15 minutes. Enjoy taste and quality done quick with recipes like falafel power bowls, seared steak and potatoes with Bernays sauce or southwest pork and bean burritos and let's face it, in the zombie apocalypse we gotta cook smart and we gotta cook fast. And you know what? We don't all want to be out there fighting our way to the store so you can stock up on snacks, sides, desserts and more at HelloFresh Market. Simply add these staples and sweets to your weekly order and they'll arrive on your doorstep along with your meals. More yummy food, less mortal peril. Fictional zombie apocalypse aside, I have actually used HelloFresh in real life for years and I love it. I used them long before I ever advertised for them. It saved me so much time, so much money and so much food waste. I'm also not a very good cook, so it allows me to cook and eat better. Go to HelloFresh.com slash RealLifeGhostStories22 and use the code RealLifeGhostStories22 for 22 free meals 
plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Real Life Ghost Stories 22 and use code Real Life Ghost Stories 22 for 22 free meals plus free shipping. Oh no. Oh no, what is that? Oh no, no, it was meant to be fictional. It wasn't meant to be real. Which brings us to our story this week. And you know what? I'm not even going to give you a preamble. I'm too angry. I'm too upset. Let's just get straight into it. I love an oddity. My house is full of weird and wonderful things that I've acquired over the years. A lovely listener once sent me an evil leprechaun who took pride of place in my kitchen and terrified everyone who dared to enter. He is now on my bookshelf. My friend was getting rid of her childhood clown doll because she was disturbed by it and I gladly took him on. He rode around at me in the passenger seat of my car for a very long time and he too now resides in my living room. I once purchased a Dybbuk box and had to open it in my car and was subsequently not haunted, you'll be glad to know. But whether we believe them or not, stories of cursed objects are commonplace and people have believed in cursed objects for centuries, from mummies' tombs to diamonds to vases. We accredit supernatural powers to inanimate objects, perhaps as a way to explain misfortune, or maybe just simply because, as humans, we are a superstitious bunch. The business of wheeling and dealing in cursed or haunted items has boomed in the last 10 years and just about anything can be considered haunted in the right conditions. So what are the theories behind haunted objects? Well, there are obviously sceptics who believe that there is no such thing as a haunted object and that the belief in haunted objects can be due to a number of physiological, environmental and psychological factors. Basically, if you believe something is haunted, then you might start to feel differently when you are around it. Perhaps if you have a sudden run of bad luck, you might blame the latest item you purchased. Bonus points if it looks old and creepy. There are those who believe that the haunted object is a product of a soul attached to that object. Maybe it is a piece of jewellery that was owned by an old woman who lived alone and who died in mysterious circumstances after taking in a much younger lover. Or maybe the item is a doll, once owned by a sickly Victorian child, a little girl in a dress and blonde ringlets. Then there's the possibility that some items are just soaked in bad energy. And maybe that is why bad or paranormal events surround them. Who knows? But today we are going to be looking at perhaps one of the more strange haunted items that I've come across. A set of second-hand bunk beds. South Larrabee Street was perfect. This could not be any further from the Victorian Gothic horror mansion that we often come to associate with hauntings. The Tolmans had moved into the three-bedroomed home in Dodge County, Wisconsin in 1986. To them, as they stood surveying their new kingdom, it was a place of peaceful tranquility and it was perfect for their little family. Ten houses had been built in the neighbourhood two years earlier, as part of a self-help housing project. And now, Alan and Deborah and their two small children had their chance of living out the American dream. The houses had been built just outside the town on a piece of marshland that used to be a hotspot for teenage drinking, but now it had been taken over by white one-storey houses and no sidewalks, so children scampered to and fro without a care in the world. Kenny was seven years old, and Mary Ann was barely one when they moved into the house. Deborah was pregnant and in the November would give birth to another daughter called Sarah. The Tolmans were a typical family for the area. They worked hard and were devoted to their children. All they wanted was for a quiet, peaceful life where they wanted for nothing. Deborah, in particular could not have been prouder that the home was theirs. They owned it and it felt like all of their hard work had paid off. They had budgeted so that the house would be well paid off before they retired, and it seemed like they had this whole life thing pretty well figured out. The previous owners had left the house after 18 months, so in regards to renovations, the house was pretty modern and well looked after, another stroke of good luck. But even still, Deborah and Alan wanted to make the house their own, so they set about painting and cleaning and making their house their home. 
Initially, they didn't even notice the changes in their home. It was only in hindsight that they understood that these subtle alterations had been the first warning signs of things to come. The health of the entire family had begun to decline rapidly. The kids were in and out of the doctor's office weekly. They caught every illness going and there didn't seem to be any end to it. Mary Ann was repeatedly hospitalised for illnesses like chickenpox and ear infections and isolated this would have been distressing enough but they all kept getting sick. Alan at points could barely move with back pain and it seemed like they were collectively just sick all of the time. Their first thought was a logical one. There was a material in the house that was making them sick. Maybe something that had been there before they moved in, or maybe some material that they had used in their redecoration. They were so desperate to stop the sickness that had pervaded the household that they contacted a building inspector to try and get to the bottom of it. There was no asbestos in the house, and no other toxic gases or substances were found. And Alan began to change too. Now, ordinarily, I am wary about talking about people's personalities or behaviours changing in relation to a haunted house, because let's face it, that can be caused by any number of things that aren't necessarily due to anything paranormal. But in this instance, I think it's worth noting. Alan found the night time particularly difficult in the house. He would pace around, unable to settle. He described it as feeling itchy and jittery. He became short-tempered and at one point went on a drinking binge. He had never behaved like this before and it completely shocked Deborah. They knew each other inside out and back to front and she had never seen him behave like this. Of course, like I said, you can attribute this behaviour to any number of things. But the house didn't just affect Alan. It seemed to have a profoundly negative impact on the people who visited the house too. Both Alan and Deborah were close to their family, so the house was always alive with visitors. People were constantly popping in and out, and that began to peter out. Initially, Deborah thought it was because the shiny allure of the new home had worn off, and really she thought little of it. During this time period, Deborah was diagnosed with an issue in her pregnancy. Her placenta was in the wrong position, and it meant that she was advised to do as little as possible. Her mother visited every day to help with the children and the housework. She visited every day for three months. And it was only after the baby was born that she confided in Deborah that she couldn't stand being in the house. I love the house. It's beautiful and it's perfect for you, she told Deborah. But there's something wrong with it. When I leave the house, the further away I get from it, the more relaxed I feel. I couldn't wait for the baby to be born because something about the house made me feel so tense and so wrong. I felt suffocated, like something was in the house that was creating a vacuum and sucking all the life out of me. Naturally, Deborah was shocked and also upset. Her mother had waited until the baby was born to explain her feelings to her, and Deborah decided that she needed to speak to her sister too. Oh, I'm sorry, Deb, it's the house. It makes me feel so sick every time that I'm there. When I'm in it, I get headaches and I feel like I'm going to throw up, but I'm fine the second I leave. While it was not what Deborah wanted her family to think of the house, she accepted that this was how they felt and life moved on in their little dream home. Although the dream, admittedly, was now slightly ragged at the edges. After all of the sickness in the household and the general feelings of tension, Alan and Deborah decided that a night out, just the two of them, to reconnect was just what they needed. They hired a babysitter and went to their favourite restaurant for the evening and actually it was just what they needed. They had a lovely time together. They enjoyed each other's company and they were feeling totally relaxed. When they returned home feeling content and full, they pushed open the front door and were met with a whirlwind of chaos. They barely had a foot across the threshold when the babysitter ran towards them, eyes wild and brimming with tears. She gabbled, her tongue tripping over her words as she tried to catch her breath and get her story out. Kenny and the babysitter had been sitting at the kitchen table playing a board game and everything was normal. Until they heard a soft tapping. They ignored it at first 
but it got louder and louder and eventually Kenny was completely transfixed on the chair at the other end of the table. The chair was rocking in place, shunting forwards and backwards, gaining momentum. The babysitter held her breath with her eyes wide and then bang, the chair bounced, all four legs leaving the floor and again bang, it hopped away from the table. The spell was broken and the babysitter and Kenny scrambled down from the table and left the room. The babysitter had managed to get Kenny calmed down and put him to bed and the house was otherwise quiet. Alan and Deborah did not know what to say or how to respond to the claims of the babysitter but they felt that it was unfair to dismiss her outright particularly when she was clearly so upset. They calmed her down, paid her and dropped her home and in bed that night they didn't even discuss it but both of them mused over what she had said. The next morning, when Kenny came down for breakfast, Deborah asked him what had happened the night before, and his story matched that of the babysitters. And strange as it was in the hubbub of life, Deborah and Alan forgot about it. Over the next six months, all was quiet. Eventually, in mid-1987, when baby Sarah was around eight months old, the Tolmans decided that they needed to do a bedroom switch around in the house. Kenny was moved into the smaller bedroom and the girls moved into the larger bedroom with a set of bunk beds. And something happened in this move that would change the family's lives forever. Kenny slept with a clock radio in his bedroom he would fall asleep with the radio on and a sleeper alarm would turn the radio off automatically. The first night Kenny moved rooms, he was up and complaining to his mother that the radio station kept switching channels. This had never been an issue before, but Deborah assumed that it was just a fault and went back to his room and reset the radio and he hopped back into bed. But no sooner had Deborah settled down again, and Kenny was up and sobbing that the radio was changing stations again, but this time he could physically see the dials turning. Bedtime had never been an issue with Kenny, and whatever was happening for him, Deborah and Alan could see that he was genuinely terrified. Deborah wondered if it was the move and a new neighbourhood and a new school that had caused him some emotional distress and he didn't know how to verbalise it. Either way, The nightly routine was becoming stressful and another night, Kenny fled from his room screaming, claiming that the little suitcase that was under his bed had shot out across the floor and then shot back under his bed. Neither Deborah or Alan were witness to any of this, so they didn't believe that any of it was actually happening. Eventually, due to repeated incidents of this, both the radio and the suitcase were removed from Kenny's room. Almost like it was contagious, all of the children began experiencing disturbances. Deborah was convinced that something in the house was waking the children up. At this point, she didn't think it was paranormal, simply something environmental that she just couldn't figure out. She would check on the children and they would be soundly and deeply asleep. And then just as she would go to bed herself, one of the children would wake up in absolute distress, kicking and screaming. Deborah and Alan would lie awake at night listening to Mary Ann, chitter-chattering away to no one, and initially they thought that she was sleep-talking or maybe talking to her dolly, but soon Mary Ann became afraid of the thing that she was talking to. She would crawl into bed and be distraught that her parents couldn't hear or see what she could. The nighttime disturbances continued for the children, and Deborah had instances where she would hear the garage door open and shut so clearly that she would ring her neighbours so that they would come and help her check to see if someone had come into the garage. Obviously, there was never anyone there. Deborah began to have violent nightmares, and they came nightly and she would wake up inconsolable. She got to the point where she was absolutely terrified that she would have these nightmares every night forever. Alan would lie on the floor of the girls' room at night time and wait for them to fall asleep and then he would move to Kenny's room and lie on the floor until Kenny fell asleep. When Alan was in the children's room, he could hear the banging and scratching that the children had been complaining about. Multiple times he checked the basement, as he thought it might be the boiler, but the boiler was fine. Just the normal clinks and soft beeps. 
He had the house checked for rodents, convinced that maybe they had rats or mice in the walls, and nothing. But still the scratching and the knocking noises continued. Throughout this time, Deborah and Alan never actually really spoke about what was happening. They would speak about individual instances and discuss what was happening with the children, but they never sat down and talked about what they thought was happening in the house. There was no talk of hauntings or demons. They just assumed there were a series of unfortunate events, or it was the product of their children's imaginations. Alan decided that he needed to paint the basement, and with his materials in tow, he set about doing the job. They had plans to turn the basement into some extra rooms, so this was the start of it. As Alan methodically painted away, Deborah called him upstairs and he laid his paintbrush across the painting tray and went upstairs to answer her. When he returned, the paintbrush had been taken and put into the paint pot handle first. He knew without a shadow of a doubt that he had not left it that way and instead of saying anything, he just asked Deborah to throw him down some towels to clean up the brushes. As he continued working, he noticed a shadow out of the corner of his eye. He told himself it was a trick of the light, but he couldn't ignore the cold chill that had run down his spine. He stopped what he was doing and went upstairs, but he still did not discuss it with Deborah. The work continued in the basement and one morning when Alan went down to work, a cold breeze hit him. Except this was definitely not supernatural. The basement window was gone. He stared in disbelief and then realised that the basement window had been removed in its entirety and placed carefully against the basement wall. To him and Deborah, this was absolutely human intervention. Someone was messing with them. They didn't feel as though they had been burgled because there seemed to be no negative interaction with the household and nothing had been taken. But the window had definitely been physically removed. But why? Why would anyone do that? The window was also high off the ground so it seemed impossible that someone would have been able to manoeuvre it in such a way that they could remove the glass and place it that far down onto the ground. They didn't call the police because nothing had been stolen but it certainly made them feel on edge. They put a lock on the door down to the basement. As the Tolmans didn't discuss the situation with each other, they certainly didn't discuss it with the wider families. They were shocked, therefore, when the strangeness of the house began to seep into Alan's family too. Deborah's mother and sister had already voiced their concern about the house, and when Deborah needed to take Alan to the hospital, they called Alan's mother to come and look after the kids instead. When they arrived back a couple of hours later, Alan's mother was waiting at the door with her keys in hand. She barely asked how Alan was, and then got into her car and drove away as quickly as she could. Deborah was perplexed and decided that she would call Alan's mother and see if there had been an issue. And there had been an issue. Deborah, something happened in the house. I had settled the children down to bed and I decided to have a nap on the sofa and something woke me up. And I didn't know what it was, but then I sat up and looked at the window. There were a pair of green eyes with red pupils looking in at me. I thought I was imagining it, but I blinked and they were still there. These red glowing eyes. I'm sorry, but I don't want to be in that house. And again, the Tolmans rationalised it. It must have been car headlights. She was definitely confused. Right? Because there was no real pattern to the incidents in the house, the Tolmans couldn't really pinpoint what was happening. Mary Ann continued to have nighttime conversations with an unseen entity. But an unfortunate event changed the way that Marianne would interact with whatever she was seeing. As her grandmother was flicking through the channels one day, Marianne accidentally saw a scene from a horror film where a bonfire was burning and a man with a pig's head on ran towards the screen. Understandably, this traumatised Marianne and she was obsessed with fires and monsters from that point onwards and claimed multiple times to have seen fires in the house. 
Kenny had not seen the television but began to complain of an old woman that would be in his bedroom at night time, a little old hag that appeared to be glowing like a fire. When Deborah tried to calm Kenny down by telling him that maybe it was an angel, he responded, No mommy, she's too ugly and scary to be an angel. This was the first time that Deborah and Alan sat down to talk about what was happening in their home. And Alan finally told Deborah all of the strange little things that had been happening to him, including feeling a bucket being pulled out of his hands while he was in the garage. They decided to do the only thing they knew to do, which was to call their local pastor, who told them that the devil was in their house. They had their house blessed, but neither of them believed that the devil or a demon was in their house. On Thursday, January the 7th, 1988, Alan arrived home from work. As he put his hand on the door handle, he felt a gust of wind pass over him from the direction of the garage and a voice called, Come here! Alan didn't know what to do. On the one hand, he thought there could be someone in the garage, and on the other hand, he was equally as terrified that there wasn't someone in the garage. Come here! So he stood frozen, and the voice continued, and it was one final, loud, Come here! that made Alan move and this time he moved towards the garage. As he approached the garage door he realised something was wrong. The garage was glowing and he could see flames flickering. It was on fire and glowing in the doorway were an unmistakable pair of eyes with irises of green and glowing red pupils. He turned and ran in fear and then realised that his garage was on fire and he needed to do something. When he returned to the garage, it was calm and peaceful, as if nothing had happened. Alan was really frightened now. It was one o'clock in the morning, he had just finished a long shift, and he ran back to his front door, and as he tore down the hallway, he felt something push him hard from behind. He was pushed with such force that he stumbled forward and dropped his lunchbox and his thermos. Neither him nor Deborah slept that night. They tried to keep the activity away from the children. They did not want the children to see that they were scared. And during the day it seemed brighter. The daylight seemed to take the edge off their fears. But as night fell the tension in the house would grow. Kenny was still talking about the little old hag and Deborah would hear him at night time saying Leave me alone! I don't want you here! At night the windows and doorknobs would rattle and they were still no closer to understanding what was happening. On Friday January the 8th a teenage visitor to the house walked into the kitchen to see the refrigerator door wide open. This would ordinarily not be an issue, but the fridge was tilted backwards and the door physically couldn't stay open, but it was as though it was being held open. Later, the teenager reported to Alan that he had seen a glowing red light in the centre of the garage. In fact, he asked Alan what sort of light it was because he thought it looked cool. There was no red light in the garage. That evening, as usual, Alan lay on the floor of the girls' room while they were going to sleep. They were calm and relaxed and he was listening to their deep breathing when he heard a sound, like a howling of the wind. The sound was similar to a sound that he had heard when he thought the garage was on fire. He sat up and listened, thinking that it may be the furnace. But rising from the carpet came a fog, a misty substance that grew until it was nearly floor to ceiling. Alan slowly sank backwards against the wall, not daring to take his eyes off the mist. The mist took on a shape, a human figure shimmering into the room. And right there were two green eyes with red pupils fixed on Alan. It raised an arm and moved towards him, and a voice erupted from it. You're dead. And as quickly as it appeared, it disappeared in a burst of light. When Deborah found Alan, 
she thought he was having a heart attack. He was snow white and his lips were blue. He was shaking and tears were streaming down his face. Eventually he was able to tell her what happened and by this point Deborah had already called a pastor not knowing what else to do. The children had not awoken during this incident in the girls' bedroom and that night the family packed a suitcase and left. As they were driving away, Deborah thought she saw the flickering of flames in the garage, but in the blink of an eye it was gone. The night after, they returned to the house and received another blessing, and on the advice of the pastor, they played church music all night. And They had never had a more peaceful night in the house. The children all slept well, and the morning was calm. Alan had asked his nephew Jonathan to stay in the house while he was working, and he did. Alan rang every hour during his shift which started at 1pm and ended at around 1am. Everything in the house remained quiet and calm and there were no issues. But by 8.15pm, Deborah had packed up the children and Alan's nephew and they were sitting in the car outside Alan's workplace and this is what happened in Deborah's words. I had a habit of getting the kids ready for bed at about 8 o'clock. But with what happened to Alan on Saturday night, I didn't want to go to the room with the kids. Jonathan went back there. I was going to do some housework. God, that had to be the most horrible night of my life. I was doing the dishes and all of a sudden he started screaming, Debbie, Debbie, come quick, please come back here. I just stood there. I didn't know what to do. But I ran to the phone to try and call the pastor and he wasn't there. I could hear him crying out. Debbie, come here quick. Oh my God. Oh my God. I didn't know what was going on. By this point, the children were screaming that they could see it. Finally, Jonathan came out of the room. I asked him what was happening and he said it was in there. I asked him where Sarah was and he said she was still in the bedroom. I told him to get Sarah and we were leaving. We were not staying there anymore. I got our coats. The kids were hysterical. I said we were going to daddy's work. I turned off all of the lights except for the one in Kenny's room. I wouldn't go back there. And one in the living room. I got them all in the car. And when I pulled out of the driveway, as I went past the house, Kenny said, Mom! Mom, it's looking out the window at us! In conversation, it transpired that Jonathan had had an almost identical experience to Alan. A foggy figure had risen out of the carpet and swooped towards him. The family were not going back. And as they drove past the house, every single light was on. They never did go back to the house. But the house was wrapped up in a media frenzy. Word had spread that this family had fled because of a haunting and the family stayed anonymous for the most part and refused to be a part of any interviews for a very long time. They were very well protected by a local police officer who did not believe that the house was haunted but was absolutely convinced that the family believed it was and that they had been through something traumatic and needed to be looked after. So, why did I start the story with bunk beds? Well, that's what this story is always pitched as. The family bought a set of haunted bunk beds in a second-hand shop for $100, and with that, the activity started. But in the extensive chapter of the book Haunted America that covers this case, the bunk beds are mentioned in passing once. Yet somehow they seem to have become the focal point for the story, and I think a media frenzy is to blame. At the time, the media wrote relentlessly about this story. And much of what they wrote was wildly untrue. They reported that blood had run down the walls, that there was a snowplow that was trying to mow people down with no driver, and that the house was a portal to hell, and that the house was built on a Native American burial ground, of course, and none of this was even remotely true. But what is true is that what happened to this family, whatever it was, profoundly impacted them, and it still impacts them to this day. Even now, Deborah and Alan get a chill when the sun goes down, fearful that whatever lived on South Larrabee Street will come for them once more. If you're as disappointed by the lack of bunk beds as I am, then you're not alone, okay? 
because I, I came across this story. I was looking for stories this week and I don't know why how I came across this one. Maybe I was looking for like haunted objects or something. And I was like, haunted bunk beds? Absolutely, yes. Let's get into that. Multiple sources talked about how they'd bought these bunk beds for $100, blah, 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 blah. So I was like, okay, followed the link to where these sources were coming from. And it was from like newspaper reports of the time, which were like, oh, Deborah Tolman said that it was the bunk beds that did it. And then they took the bunk beds and buried them in a wasteland that no one's ever going to find them. And I was like, wow, they must really believe it was the bunk beds. Anyway, so I, I, I went looking for this book, this haunted America book. And in the entire chapter, which contains contains really detailed eyewitness testimony from Deborah and Alan and actually the police officer involved but from the, nobody mentioned the bunk beds aside from when they redecorated and moved the bunk beds into the girls room like nobody mentioned the bunk beds I don't know how they ended up everybody getting so fixated on the bunk beds but I don't think the bunk bed fixation is warranted I just want to say as well if you can hear any background noise for some reason my street has literally come alive as I've been recording this like the people who live next door their kids have been like barreling around the place They're, they say kids they've only got one kid I'm pretty sure she can't walk but she's been barreling around they've been chitter chattering people have been going up and down the street I don't know what's going on you know it's it, it just seems to have come alive so if you hear anything in the background I apologise I also need to give an honourable mention to the police officer in this story. Such an honourable mention that I actually didn't write down his name and now I can't remember it. But he was re- he seemed like a really good egg. So he got involved because word was on the street that this house was haunted and this family had fled. And somebody called him anonymously and said, hey, did you hear that the Tolman family had to leave the house in the middle of the night like something's going on? And he was worried because he was thinking they've been through some sort of mental health crisis and you know I need to make sure everything's okay which fair play to him and that's what he did and he went and he sought out the family and he spoke to them and he said that he could see straight away when he saw them that they had been through something really traumatic and at that point he was like I don't believe that it's haunted I'll never believe that it's haunted but they had been through something and they needed to be looked after so he spoke to reporters and like warned people he even made a statement to reporters where he said something like when people are at their lowest um people like you seem to think it's okay to come and kick them while they're down basically because he recognized that this family whatever they've been through they've had enough and they spoke to one reporter at the time anonymously but only through this police officer deborah tolman even had an offer to go on oprah which obviously you know was a really big deal and she turned it down. So I don't think this family did it for fame and fortune. I'll put it that way. I don't think they wanted all this story to be in the papers, etc. And just this police officer is definitely the king of green flags. So he spent a lot of time with the family. He made sure that they were okay. He made sure that they stayed anonymous. He made sure that they had like a motel to stay in while they found somewhere else to live. He also made statements like, you know, I've seen weird things on the job that I've never been brave enough to talk to anybody about because I've always been afraid of being ridiculed. And that is what is happening to these people. And he just recognised that like, regardless of what happened you know, regardless of what what people believed happened, something happened to them and therefore they had been through this great trauma. And I just, it's not often you get people like that in these kinds of stories. So I was like, go on police officer, go on police chief, you're a good guy. There were two bits of this story that I left out. So the first bit was about them getting a kitten. They got a kitten, which they called Cat, in the early days of moving into the house and they said like they rehomed the kitten because the kitten went absolutely crazy in the house and they later attributed that to the house itself but to be honest what they were describing sounded like pretty kitten behavior to me as a non-kitten expert you know the kitten was like (laughs) climbing on the curtains swinging out of things (laughs) climbing up the walls and I was like have you met kittens like they can be they can be they can be a handful they also got a dog who behaved uh who behaved what they said behaved badly in the house it was a i think they said it was a golden labrador and they said things like oh the dog would be in the kennel all day and it'd be fine but as soon as night fell the dog would start barking and i was kind of like well don't don't keep the dog in the kennel all day you know and i think it seems like in hindsight they were attributing the behavior of the dog to the house too which maybe necessarily wasn't really what was happening just wanted to make that really clear because sometimes when I leave things out of stories I get angry messages from people saying why did you leave this bit out but that's why I didn't include those bits in the story 
there's a part of me that thinks was it environmental was it a case of something like carbon monoxide poisoning or will if you're listening was it something to do with infrasound you know what i mean and a lot of the evidence is sort of led by the kids not that i'm saying that kids are 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 lying i'm not saying they're lying at all but were they were they egging each other on and kids are far more perceptive than we have to give them credit for so even though deborah and alan were trying to keep things from the kids like maybe the kids were picking up on things and therefore were you know acting out those feelings and worries and fears and acting them out in the only way that they knew how what i thought was really interesting was when marianne saw the accidentally saw the horror film bit of the um bonfire and the man with the pig head running towards the screen like oh i've that's happened to me when i've been looking after kids before where they've seen something and i've gone oh shit you know when you're ac- when you're flicking through channels my one was um my cousin when we were really little or when he was really little rather i let him watch an episode of goosebumps not thinking that he would like take in what was happening uh, he absolutely did take in what was happening and he had horrendous nightmares and I got in so much trouble. So it can really impact kids when they see things like this. And what was interesting was that after Marianne saw that on the TV, she then started worrying about fires. She would be up in the night saying, oh, my, my bedroom door is on fire. She started obsessing about monsters being in her bedroom. And then, then it was only after that point that Alan claimed that he saw the fire in the garage And that Deborah thought she saw a fire flickering in the garage as she was driving away from the house. So was it a little case of hysteria? Everybody feeding into each other's fears? And it does sound like these kids were just rocked in around being really creepy, to be honest. There was a great bit in the the chapter where Deborah had said the night that Jonathan saw the creature, the foggy creature, she had told the children that if if you see anything in your bedroom, it's just the baby Jesus... (laughs) coming to um coming to look after you because she was trying to like alleviate their worries like like telling kenny that the old hag lady was actually an angel she was doing what she could to alleviate their worries so she had said to them when something appears in your bedroom it's just the baby jesus um coming to look after you so uh, w- it's, there's this great bit in the story where she's saying that jonathan is on the floor like screaming about this shadowy foggy figure that like came towards him and said something like you are involved now in the meantime, Marianne is running around screaming, don't worry, it's the baby Jesus. It's just the baby Jesus. Don't worry. And <laughs> Deborah's going, it's not the baby Jesus. I didn't know how to write that into the story and make it scary because I just found it so funny. But it, you could imagine that actually the absurdness of that, you could imagine it happening in real life that this thing that you've told the kids, oh, you know, it's just the baby Jesus or whatever, would come back and haunt you. You could totally imagine that happening and and afterwards being like, what a fucking weird situation that was. What I what I want to give him credit for in this story as well. Now, you don't know how much of this actually happened in the way that they're telling it because it was so long ago. But you have to give them credit for not jumping to conclusions in the beginning. It seems like a lot of their interpretations of things is in hindsight, which I do also think is a double-edged sword. Because what you end up with then is you look back and you try and, and you're going, is was that was that because I was in a bad mood or was that because of the house? Like, were we sick because we were sick or were we sick because of the house? When you're looking at these things in hindsight, do you then attribute every perceived misfortune to the entity that's in the house? So on the one hand, I'm like, fair play to you. Like, you didn't, you didn't fall apart at the first perceived sign of a ghost in the house. You kind of kept your heads, you kept it together you were trying to rationalise all of these things, like fair play to you. But the other side of me is like, oh, are you looking back now and thinking everything is to do with the house? And I also want to say as well, like fair play to them for standing their ground with the pastor. I know they went back to him again, because I, but I understand that because they were thinking, oh my God, like we haven't, we haven't figured this out. We still need to figure it out. But the pastor immediately said to them, oh, the devil is in your house or at least a demon. And I think it was Alan Tolman who said, I just feel like, I don't know what the devil or demon would be doing in my house. And I just thought it was a really good point. I was like, yeah, you're you're kind of dead right. And the thing obviously that permeates through this story is these eyes, these green eyes with red pupils. What a cool description. 
I don't think I've ever had a description like that before. And initially when I was writing this story, I misread it. So I'd only written it down as red eyes, which is not as cool as green eyes with red pupils. I just think it's a great description. We haven't seen it before. I don't know what it means. I do think that fundamentally it's interesting that all of these different people came into the house and had experiences. As in, they came into the house and went, oh, this house gives me the ick. I don't want to be here anymore. Or they saw something or they experienced something. And I would love to know in reality how much Deborah and Alan shared with their family members. Was was it a case where actually they shared a lot more than they thought they had shared and therefore their family members were primed coming into the house? All in all, it was a great story despite the distinct lack of bunk beds. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to send in your story, you can do so by emailing it to Podcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website com. Remember, all of the sources where I got all the information from are linked in every single episode. So if you want to go check out that, that Haunted America book, the link to it is in the description of this episode. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can check out our Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash Real Life Ghost Stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad-free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. <laughs>